Chopra. Yay. I, uh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, good to be with everybody today. And uh, Senator, it's nice to see you as well. I would love to spend the bulk of my time engaging with you on your questions, but if you'll indulge with me for a few moments, I'd love to share with you a little bit about uh, my story, uh, where I've come from, and what I stand for, and I'm hopeful that that uh, might facilitate some conversation during our Q&A. Just as a, a bit of personal background, uh, please raise your hand. How many of you were born outside of Virginia? Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I was actually born in Trenton, New Jersey. Yay? Yay? Wow, all right. Well, uh, Trenton is famous because there's a bridge that connects Pennsylvania to New Jersey, and it says, Trenton makes the world takes, if any of you have seen this bridge. Now, uh, I want to share with you why that's relevant in a moment, but let me just begin by saying uh, Trenton is where my father landed uh, when he came from India as an immigrant. Now, if you recall, President Johnson in 1965 opened up immigration opportunities for those from South Asia. And uh, my father came in 66. By the way, if you ever want to know what it would take to make someone a lifelong Democrat, um, allowing you into the country builds you some deep loyalty. So let's just start with that. And the president uh, invited folks to come in, and my dad, believing that America was the land of opportunity, came here for graduate school in engineering, and actually was working in Trenton helping to make air conditioning systems, and he had three patents. But the dynamics of our economy are such that even the story of an immigrant who was able to lift his family into the middle class, in one generation, Trenton is half the size it was, and it no longer makes and there frankly isn't much export, there isn't much that people are taking. Our family was born on the principle that education was the key focus, no matter what the dynamic nature of an economy might be, that if you focused on education, you had a chance to make it in this great country. And that's the core bedrock principle that motivates me, it is both professionally and personally throughout my life. When I uh, thought about this race and the time we're in, in 2013, I acknowledged the following basic principle for why I wish to stand to serve as our Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth. I strongly believe that state government in Richmond, we can be faster, better, smarter, and fairer in, challenge, in tackling the challenges that confront us on this very day. And I've seen firsthand over the six years that I've been involved in public service, following a near decade-long career in the private sector, I've seen firsthand that people, when empowered with technology and innovation, have a chance to lift themselves up and to have a real impact in their lives. One small story. I met Elantis Hall, a 34-year-old part-time bartender with four kids who had been in and out of community college for 10 years, but earned no degree and was suffering in an economy. Didn't really have a sense for where she might end up. I met her because President Obama wanted to rethink our relationship with cities and picked a few to pilot a new program called Strong Cities, Strong Communities. And as part of that effort, we thought to try a new idea in Elantis' community. Our thought was, the current educational system isn't meeting her where she is. We need to try a new tack. Let's invent a better opportunity for her to see if she might reach her full potential. So we decided to create an IT boot camp. 18 weeks, 9 to 5, 5 days a week. Elantis decided at the urging of her pastor, who said, Elantis, I believe in you. You have a future. Give this a shot. You have talent. She scored a 92% on the ability to find mistakes in software code. And by the end of the 18-week program, she landed a full-time job at a healthcare IT company making $30,000 a year, full benefits, a desk job, and a career that has no end in sight. And when I spoke with Elantis, it is a, yeah, we do celebrate the story, but when I spoke with her, at, after all of this, her comment to me was a niche. The thing that's so exciting is I have a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> and the point was she was confident. 
we changed the service that we delivered to Alantis. Met her where she was. And it had an impact. It had an impact. This theory of opening up opportunity for those who just need someone to give them a chance and a fair shot, frankly, a fair shot, that this is the opportunity of our time. If you combine new ideas in a community that has core values of fairness for all and opportunity, if you, if you take a chance on yourself, then we can decide for ourselves what the next decade for Virginia and therefore the country could be. Two quick observations, if I may, before I turn to your questions about what it is that I hope to accomplish and in the context that we're in right now. I say this without much hyper, hyperbolic views, but I, I want you to understand how I feel about this. The Commonwealth has been phenomenal over the last several decades. And we've won every award you can imagine. Best man in state, best state for business, best place to raise a family. But we have stalled. And the next four years, I'd actually say the next five, if we don't correct the ship and make better choices as a Commonwealth, we will suffer the consequences for the next 40 or 50. You know, a lot of folks have seen the greatness of Virginia. And they're not sitting back just looking at us and say, wow, gee, good for them. They're looking to leapfrog us. And they're taking every opportunity they can to make sure that everyone in their communities have a chance at the American dream. <laughs> but the Republican agenda in Richmond has been stifling our progress. Yes, we can celebrate and laugh at all the terrible things that made us on late night comedy shows. Somewhat humorous for us if you, you take a look at what they're saying to us. But it's a, it's a dreadful statement about where we are as Virginians. It's not just about the negative things that they've done on social issues and for women, but they've actually stifled our capacity to innovate. And frankly, they've turned a blind eye on opportunities that have been available to us, but they've chosen not to go after. When I was serving the president, I couldn't tell you how depressing it was. Every opportunity we put in front of the Commonwealth. Do you want to modernize the electrical grid? Do you want to modernize your health care system? Do you want to modernize the educational system? Billions of dollars of competitive grants. And I watched crickets chirp from Virginia. We didn't apply and we haven't won any of them. Any of them. Any of them. And it was disheartening because we know that Richmond doesn't have the money to fund a lot of these ideas. And here the president's offering us a chance to fight and demonstrate we have the capacity. We just chose to grab our marbles and go home. That's not Virginia, by the way. When I was in Governor Kane's cabinet, there was an enthusiasm and a hunger to make us a better place. And I don't know what happened. My gut, my gut instinct is bad leadership took our eye off the ball. My personal point of view is this. The folks in Richmond have let their partisan ideology get in the way of thoughtful and common sense ideas to move us forward. And you know what's happened since they've done this? For the first time in Virginia history, 25 to 34 year olds have less educational attainment than those in the generations that preceded them. We have fallen backwards in educational attainment at a time when President Obama said we need by 2020 to be number one again in the world. So this challenge that's presented to us because of what these folks have done in Richmond suggests to us that we have, it's not too late to write this ship, but we're going to have to do it in 2013. If you entrust me with your support, I would like to suggest to you three very basic principles that we're going to accomplish together. And it sits these three principles sit in a, in a statement that says, for, for Democrats for generations, we have been about the business of working to advance our values through better ideas and new ways. Well, we need new ideas and new ways, and I think we need them in three very simple ways. Number one, by the end of the decade, we need 100,000 net new college graduates, so Virginia will lead the country in demonstrating our capacity of the highest skilled workforce in the world. That's in our line of sight, but we're going to have to have a net 100,000 pickup in graduates. You don't do that when you're cutting funding for higher ed, and you don't do it when you turn your back on the president's ideas that actually expand access to higher ed and improve our K-12 system. Second, we need to diversify our economy. Did you all see the GDP report yesterday? Yeah. 
negative 0.1 percent. Does anybody know what made the country's GDP go to negative 0.1 percent? The Republicans. Well, that's fine. Defense. <laughs> Defense Department spending fell 18 percent. Okay? 10 percent of the state's budget is tied to that one investment pocket. We need to diversify our economy with expansion of opportunities of new businesses, new businesses, that by the end of the decade, if, if we get a chance to get into office, will grow 100,000 net new jobs. But third, this speaks to our fundamental sense of fairness. Forbes has said that more than half of the startups that will be created in our economy will be run by women. Run by women. Yeah, that's great. Unless you're in a state that says to women, leave, if you want to have your rights protected, and you want to just live what you believe to be a fundamental basic sense of fairness in our society. How do we engage on conversations of educational opportunity and economic growth in an environment where we're going to start the conversation by insulting women, members of our gay and lesbian community, immigrants, who, if you think about this mathematically, you're starting the war for talent with 75% of your human capital tied behind your back. And that's no formula for our success. I strongly believe that we can write the next chapter of Virginia's chapter of democracy together. That we have all the tools that we need. We didn't lose all of our capacity for greatness in the last several years. We just lost our focus. That if you give us the chance, we can come together and organize around these very key goals. And as your Lieutenant Governor, I will fight every single day to bring them a reality. If you believe in this vision, I strongly encourage you to join us. This is a grassroots conversation at teamchopra.org. And together, let's make sure that Virginia is the best place for our children so that they can live a better life than our own. As a father of two young girls, I want them to raise their future families right here in the Commonwealth. Thank you so very much. to any questions, topics, concerns, suggestions. I'd love to hear them and be responsive to all. Todd, you may go first. On the topic of business transformation and as well as a, a research triangle with our college and universities to try to move from such a large amount of military spending to, we, we do a lot of software. We do large scale software, uh, but we need to move that into the private sector. How, how do you see I'll repeat the question for those who didn't hear it. Todd's asking, how do we create basically regional uh, ecosystems, might be a word I would use, Todd, uh, to support the, 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 the migration of our economy to diversify it to new businesses? Uh, the short answer to this, uh, Todd, is President Obama initiated a program called Startup America. Have any of you heard of Startup America? This is a public-private partnership that uh, Steve Case Michael Dell and a number of other executives from around the world have organized over a billion dollars of resources outside of the taxpayer's budget. This is all private financing, private support to grow and support new businesses uh, in every corner of the country. And as and I had the pleasure of serving as, as one of the president's lead uh, advisors on this particular topic. This is something that I've dedicated a great deal of my time and focus to. Todd, the, uh, what the conclusion we learned from Startup America is the, the way economies grow is by having nurturing communities, nurturing communities, and to tap into their internal talents, which is why a year ago yesterday, I stood with Steve Case announcing the launch of Startup Virginia. We have over 560 technology firms and other non-technology companies who are part of it, this initiative and movement, all for free. And the centerpiece of it was what Todd said, growing regional community ecosystems. There's a Charlottesville community, there's a Blacksburg Roanoke community, there's a Hampton Roads community, a Richmond community, and a community here in Northern Virginia. And they are all organizing the support services they need to support these activities. Final comment. In Governor Kane's cabinet, he understood that this is not just regional within Virginia, but if you take a look at the broader view, our economy is tied to Maryland and D.C. as well. I, I had the pleasure of serving as Governor Kane's appointed representative to the Chesapeake Crescent Initiative. Maryland, D.C., Virginia, the Governor of Maryland, Mayor of D.C., and, and Governor of Virginia, all working together 
to find ways to unlock new industries in our economy, and we started with our universities. How do we move more research ideas to the marketplace? If you check out Virginia Innovation Partnership, you'll see already a growing number of, of these companies that are spurring out of our great universities. Yes, please. Oh, you're waiting for the waiter. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thumbs up for a question, I suppose, and uh, hands for the waiters. Yes. Um, good afternoon. I was talking about this race to somebody who is in touch with people who are supposedly influential within the Democratic Party. Wow. Okay. Telling, uh, that I'm impressed by... I was with you because I heard an interview with you on the radio and how thoughtful and interesting and innovative your ideas were. And uh, um, what this person told me was that the rap here um, is that people down the I-81 corridor aren't yet ready for somebody with your skin color to be um, Lieutenant Governor of the state of Virginia. Doug, and I, Doug what Wilder. I want to know is what your Doug take Wilder. is on this. Um, Doug I, I Wilder. Wow. Explicitly now. Barack Obama. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, if you hadn't heard it, it was about whether or not there are um, uh, hidden biases in our electorate for those uh, perhaps casting a ballot for an Anish Chopra. Uh, I, I obviously strongly disagree with the premise of it. I spent probably 70 to 80 percent of my time in the Kane administration focused on economic growth opportunities in Southside and Southwest and the communities were ex exceedingly welcoming exceedingly welcoming when Mark Warner moved the 700 tech jobs to uh, Southwest Virginia and Lebanon the uh, first group of folks who kind of moved into town if you will were Indian technology professionals who weren't, went to work for CGI and I went down to visit and the big joke was, I said, so how's the neighborhood? What, how you feeling? They said, oh my goodness, this is the greatest, most welcoming community. But one thing, Anish, could you help us attract an Indian grocery store? <laughs> and, and I asked some of the guys for, who were on the town council and, 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 and down there in Lebanon, and they said, Anish, I got to tell you, watching the guys play cricket in the hills of, 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 of uh, Russell County was something they found very exciting and new and, ex and interesting. Now, these are anecdotes, obviously. I can't speak to broad electoral things. But uh, we have had in Manassas Park the election of Suhas, uh, now to two terms. He was the second highest vote getter during the very difficult election we had when Democrats uh, struggled a bit in uh, 09. And uh, we've got electoral evidence to be sure in other parts of the country, in South Carolina and Louisiana. So, look, my point of view is three basic things Americans in general view and Virginians specifically view. What are your ideas for the future? Can you accomplish them? And what will that mean for my family? And my personal opinion is on all three scores, I hope what I shared with you today in slight short, uh, I wish I was shorter, but uh, still short, uh, attempt to describe those things reflect the values that we, uh, I think Virginians generally believe. And if we go to the core, will your family live a better life than you? And can they do so in your community? If you can wake up in the morning and say, I feel that in my bones, You'll feel better about your uh, Virginia, and we'll fe you'll feel better our, about our success, and that's what I hope to convey to people. Yes, please. I, I just want to say about 20 some years ago, for the three statewide offices, there was a black, a woman, and you running, and the black one is still wild. Ah. So it has happened. It has happened. Frank. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the evidence. That's right. In the back. One second. Comment. Comment. This is called the Jim Audible. Yeah. In matters of technology, you always have Jim on the spot. So he found a second mic. We're good to go. Thanks. Hi. Uh, in my personal view, a lot of the trouble we have in, here in Virginia is that people who turn out in the presidential elections, for whatever reasons, won't vote in other elections. I know that nationwide, about twice as many Obama voters didn't vote in 2010 as his views were Clinton voters. And of course, we all saw what happened as a result. What can you bring to help get the people who voted last November, stood in the long lines, to get them to get past this, oh my god, I've got to vote again, mentality? 
Uh, I, I would say thank three things. Uh, thank you for the question. I would say three things. Uh, one, let me just share some data. When Mark Warner ran following Al Gore's race, he attracted 84% of the vote from the off year, I mean, from the uh, from the presidential year. When Governor Kane ran following John Kerry, he attracted 72%. When Cree Deeds ran following President Obama, he attracted 39%. So the math is fairly clear. We've got to be north of 39, and if we can aspire to Kane levels and Warner levels, we, the Democratic ticket will run the table. Now, we've done it before is what I meant by that statement. Number two, I do believe it's about message and about conveying the importance of this election to Virginians. You know, when we look at the news, we keep touting ourselves. If you look in the rearview mirror, we're awesome because all of our accolades are reflecting the results of leadership from Warner Kane several years back. And so we've got that best managed, best uh, based, we have all the accolades. But when you take a look at the forward look, the projections, our rate of, tra our improvement trajectory, we've, as I said, we've declined. So as people get familiar with those risks, they'll understand the importance. Uh, and third, I think you have to be very clear, my personal opinion, we have to run a flawless campaign in 2013. I'm very thankful that Terry is uh, making some really smart decisions at the top of the ticket to build a really smart campaign, but we've got to build on the progress with the president. You know, a lot of folks that were engaged in 2012, they're now getting more. Look at the turnout today. This is a phenomenal uh, story. I believe we can engage uh, those activists earlier this year and use every communications channel possible. Reach out to them in local meetings, reach out to them on the internet, reach out to them in every which way possible, given the importance of the race. So, you're right, that is our challenge, but I see the math is very achievable. Others? Yes, sir. Oh, that's the time clock. So we've had the call for the waiter, call for the time clock. Yes, in the back. Yes, please. Mr. Farrell. Yes, Mr. Joe. Good to have you here again. Thank you, sir. You and I have had this conversation, and you've taken a bit of time to think about it, and I want to ask, after you've had a chance to think about it, yes. what are we going to do about the following? Half of the kids in Christopher Newport come from Fairfax County. Half of the kids at Virginia Commonwealth come from Fairfax County. Half of the kids at Old Dominion come from Fairfax County. And more than half the kids at George Mason come from Fairfax County. And the four-year graduation rate at those four universities is less than 30%. Less than 30%. And what I want you all to focus on, all of you in this room, is yes. over the last three administrations, we built four prisons down in southwest Virginia, three of them are mothballed. So I'm not interested in emphasizing research universities. I'm interested in getting our kids into college and out of college in four years. Because if I have to, and I'm not because my kids are out, but people in this room, their kids should not have to pay six years of tuition for a four-year degree. What are you going to do to change that? I, uh, John and I have had this conversation before. Let me share three very, very important points about this. Uh, college affordability was one of those issues that I worked on for President Obama. I, I, I worked on it in the following way. How, I, how might we bring innovation to the conversation? And uh, John's statistics are very right. How many of you are familiar with the President's Race to the Top proposal for higher education? You've all seen this? Uh, not for K-12, for higher education. Okay, so for those that are not familiar with it, the president offered you get more money essentially in the student loan program if you achieve graduation rates and improve college affordability. So to the works that John referenced, uh, there, the president believes that there's this opportunity to do differential reimbursement based on outcomes. I believe there's merit in that concept and I would look forward to engaging in a discussion about how states might embrace that issue. Number one. Number two, open data. How many of you saw the report that Chev put out in October? This is one of the few grants Governor McDonald agreed to, which is uh, we put out money to modernize our statewide longitudinal data system. What that means is for the first time in American history, Virginia was the first, students now entering college can see what the starting salary is 
based on the degree and the school that they choose to attend. More information to students so they can make better decisions. And that is a critical point. That's the red flag. Like my third issue, my third issue is we absolutely need new ideas to expand access so that we can be successful in this area. Under the Kane administration, UVA nearly, I wouldn't say doubled, added 90 slots to their engineering school by partnering with community colleges in Lynchburg. And uh, the it's called Produced in Virginia. It's my last comment. Okay, Produced in Virginia. Thank you.